Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, our monthly leaders forum, addressing vital issues facing society, the economy, real estate, medicine, technology, and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Platt. I'm the Executive Director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a 501c3 national charitable organization based in New York City. We at AFRMC represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabbi Medical Center of Petach Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv. The hospital serves 1 million patients annually from all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends Visit American Friends of Rabbi Medical Center online, AFRMC.org, via our website and social media outlets on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Our host and moderator for Global Connections is Robert Siegel, the former host of All Things Considered on National Public Radio for 30 years. Over the course of an hour each month, Global Connections features three to four guests who Robert Siegel interviews as they explore important issues and challenges in our world arising from the global pandemic. Today's Global Connections topic is, how do we emerge from this economic crisis? With special guest, Dr. Stanley Fisher, former Vice Chair of the US Federal Reserve and former governor of the Bank of Israel, Abby Joseph Cohen, advisory director and senior investment strategist at Goldman Sachs, Jonathan Gregg, president and chief operating officer at the Blackstone Group, and Dr. Michael Drescher, director of emergency and trauma medicine at Israel's Rabin Medical Center. And now, Global Connections with Robert Siegel. Thanks, Josh. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be hosting another Global Connections Forum on navigating uh, the new abnormal. Uh, in these forums, we consider the extraordinary changes that we've all experienced over the past several months, uh, changes in how we deal with friends and family, uh, changes in how we work, how we recreate, how we worship, uh, even how we Americans relate to one another across racial lines. Uh, today's focus is the economist, uh, the economy, excuse me. And after the interviews with our panelists, uh, we will have a question and ask, answer session in the second half hour. Uh, I'd like to invite you to use the Q&A a button at the bottom of your screen uh, to enter your questions, uh, which I can then direct to the panelists whom you've designated. Uh, our panelists are, as always, an exceptionally accomplished group. Uh, economist Stanley Fisher uh, has a resume that is unique. Uh, MIT professor, chief economist at the World Bank, deputy managing director at the International Monetary Fund, uh, vice chair of the Federal Reserve and governor of the Bank of Israel. Also, the list of his MIT doctoral students uh, is a virtual all-star team of economists and he is our leadoff panelist. Uh, Stan Fisher, welcome to Global Connections. Thanks very much. Uh, first, if our national leaders were to ask you to tell them in a nutshell uh, what the government should do to uh, navigate the economy through this uh, economic crisis brought on by the pandemic, what would you say? I start with the basics, which uh, are masks and uh, uh, space uh, space uh, guaranteeing or space uh, social distancing social distancing and uh, tell them that uh, there's a whole lot going on in the uh, are we creating uh, a uh, vaccine that will become useful any any which time and uh, when it becomes useful uh, how important will it be can it be come into action very quickly or is it going to take uh, two or three years uh, to uh, show its effects? Those seem to be the very big things uh, that are going on. And uh, 
then there are all sorts of side issues, which are side issues which are important, uh, particularly on trade mm -hmm. uh, and uh, especially on uh, what we do in our in our economy to keep uh, our food systems reasonably clear and not being a source of further uh, difficulties and further uh, further, uh, further further diseases coming out of the food system. Are you, are you worried by the increase in the debt by, well, by the trillions nowadays? Not especially. Um, I think it's being exaggerated at the moment. Uh, when the interest, if the interest rate was zero, it wouldn't matter at all uh, if we uh, had a larger debt. Um, it isn't quite zero, but it certainly is. It certainly isn't the six percent or something that uh, I grew up with as a uh, graduate student, and it's very much closer to zero. And so uh, I'm surprised at the uh, way we're dealing with uh, the uh, debt burden, which is still being measured by the ratio of debt to GDP. Uh, but the burden of that is much less than it was uh, when interest rates were much higher. And we should be measuring it by the burden of the uh, interest and other uh, costs of uh, running the debt uh, and not by the, the size of the debt relative to GDP. And that makes a very big difference. But what, what do you say to a, um, a, a deficit hawk or a skeptic who says, yeah, the interest rate is zero, but there's still the principle that at some point uh, we're, uh, we're, we're obliged to pay. And if it mounts up some year, we have to have a tax increase to address these new burdens. Well, I'd say that's, that's quite right. Right. The overall burden of the debt is significantly less when the debt is about 100% of GDP uh, than it would have been if uh, the uh, debt was uh, 58 uh, was let us say 70% of GDP. So we're just paying much less to run to borrow. And that seems a, a reasonable thing to uh, have to uh, take into account. Back in the spring, I heard a lot of people saying uh, the, uh, the, the recession, the lockdowns, the job losses were caused by something extraneous to our economy, by a virus. We get the virus under control, we'll go back to business as it was, and business was pretty good uh, at, at the beginning of all this. Uh, more recently, it looks like the economy is really changing uh, during this pandemic as it, as it lasts longer and longer, the way we travel, uh, the way we uh, uh, recreate. Should, should the point of government policy be to get us back to where we were, uh, or should it be to uh, look at what's changed and encourage the adaptations? Well, with, with a uh, small change, which is some of the things that have happened now are going to change the, the uh, amount of debt that we need, the amount of borrowing that we need. Uh, and we've got to take that into account. Uh, I don't think there'll be as many uh, nice trips to uh, France for conferences mm -hmm. as there used to be. And similarly on uh, similar uh, parts of the life of the traveling economist will be uh, different. Uh, in the future. And this can become much more serious because there are going to be developments of new drugs. And those drugs could be very important. And uh, we need to take that into account. So it won't be exactly the same. And uh, we'll have to take account of that. Now, much of that could be done through the market uh, of the, and done by the, uh, by, without the help of the government. But we certainly needed the government intervention to uh, get the uh, new drugs, if they arrive, to arrive quickly and to arrive in some sense, with some sense of timing. You feel that we're hurting for the lack of a, of a fiscal, a more active fiscal role by the, by the Congress? I think we'd do better if we had a more active fiscal role. 
uh, we're, uh, we've got a lot of unemployment at the moment. And it may come down in two years, but we don't have to suffer for two years uh, by not so as not to use fiscal policy. When, when we spoke the other day, you mentioned something that one of the big questions facing the uh, U.S. government is what, what size population do we want to have? And I, I just I was intrigued by what you said. I wanted you to elaborate for a moment. Well, I have to be modest at this point. I didn't say it. <laughs> But whoever said it said something that was useful. And uh, I don't know, I haven't thought it through very well, uh, whether we need a smaller or a larger uh, population uh, to deal with the, uh, with the coronavirus or with some, anything that increases uh, mortality. But I suppose we might say that uh, if, we're really, if the mortality rate is going up, we should... Uh, probably encourage. One uh, lesson that some people uh, at least thought they took away from uh, the past several months is that uh, certainly in the healthcare sector, just-in-time production uh, really isn't uh, the safest way to go. And indeed, uh, complex global supply chains uh, may be too fragile when we're counting on other countries for masks and pipettes and glass vials and the like. I mean, do you expect there to be uh, more economic nationalism. Both both of our both presidential candidates are running about uh, you know talking about buying American more and and building more in America. Do you do you expect a change in that in that uh, attitude? Well, I don't think that attitude, which is probably uh, inherent to uh, everybody who hasn't studied economics, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, is necessarily wrong in this case. And yes, there are certain aspects of uh, what we need uh, in terms of keeping uh, uh, keeping uh, weapons of uh, that can be used very quickly. And by weapons, I mean true. I mean uh, medicines uh, and whatever else will keep the uh, keep keep the. Uh, Disease from go, uh, growing growing as rapidly as it has in some country in some parts of this country and certainly in other parts of the world, and so uh, we'll have to uh, take a care, take a look at that and make sure that we've got reasonable uh, production capacity. But we should also take into account we need reasonable people in the government. You cannot say we've got a ter terrific. Uh, way of producing uh, this, uh, these uh, things. And we started and we spent money and we've got everything uh, working for this. And uh, then saying, oh, we don't need it. Haven't had a problem with it for the last hundred years. Mm. And uh, that's what we did. I have one question that goes back to your days in Israel. I'm just curious, given the, uh, the news of the Israeli normalization with the uh, well, also with the Kingdom of Bahrain, but more important with the United Arab Emirates. Uh, is that something that, that you think uh, would be uh, extremely helpful economically uh, to the Israelis, or is it of greater diplomatic political importance? Well, it's uh, obviously most important as a political uh, development. And uh, it means that gradually among the uh, Arab countries, the uh, fear of Israel is declining, and the fear of their fellow Arab countries is also declining, uh, and they feel more able to choose their own course. So that all is, uh, is very good. Uh, as, as you implied, Bahrain is very small, uh, but the United Arab Republic, uh, Emirates are, uh, are not that small. Their population is about the same size as Israel's. And uh, that matters, but there's not a lot of trade that goes on between these uh, countries, and they tend to trade with the uh, larger countries of the, of the world. They tend to import from Europe and and, uh, and elsewhere. Well. States, yeah. Well, Stan Fisher, I'd like and you to China, no, no doubt, and China. Uh, uh, I'd like you to please stay with us for the Q and A, which will uh, be in about twenty five minutes. Uh, Stanley Fisher, thank you very much. Uh, our second panelist <laughs> on. Uh, 
navigating the new abnormal of the pandemic economy is Abby Joseph Cohen of Goldman Sachs. Uh, for many years, she was the chief global strategist there. In, in late terms, she was the market maven. Uh, in her current role as an advisory director, she's writing about long-term uh, economic issues. Abby Joseph Cohen, uh, welcome to this Global Connections Forum on Navigating the New Abnormal. Hiya. Hello, Robert. Thank you. Uh, first question, why are the markets, I'm uh, talking about the stock market, for example, so relatively buoyant when there are tens of millions of people unemployed, businesses, especially small businesses, being shuttered uh, all around us? Is it just Fed policy or that uh, you, you can't invest in anything that pays more than, than a half percent anyway? Why, why, why is the market uh, doing so well? Well, clearly, Federal Reserve policy is an important part of this. But let's back up, up a moment. Um, while many people think that the economy and the stock market in particular are identical twins, uh, they're not. Uh, they're not even cousins uh, sometimes. Um, perhaps they're distant cousins. There are very big differences between them. Uh, one of the differences has to do with time horizon. Uh, the stock market is what we refer to as a discounting mechanism. Stock prices are related to what investors think will happen, not now, but in the future. Uh, there's another big difference right now in composition. Uh, when we look at the stock market, for example, I think many people are aware that recent stock price movement has been very much tied to a very small number of securities, mainly those in technology, perhaps pharmaceutical, whereas it doesn't really reflect the entire economy. Rather, it reflects the stocks specifically in the stock market. And there's another big difference as well, and that's valuation which is how much are you willing to pay for something? Uh, there are some companies out there that are great. They have wonderful stories, but sometimes those stories get priced uh, a little bit more than, than they should. So you're right to ask the question you did. This is a time of significant economic duress for many people. The unemployment rate, while it's come down, is still very high. In the city of New York, it's in excess of 15%. Uh, so we do have many people who remain in trouble. We have many companies, particularly smaller ones, uh, that are still uh, digging their way out. Um, and so the stock market, which reflects some of the largest, best managed and most successful companies uh, in the United States, not necessarily a good reflection for the rest of what's happening in the United States. Now that we're uh, six months or so uh, into the pandemic, I wonder which of the changes around us strike you as probably going to be passing emergency measures that we all lived through for whatever it was, one year, two years, however much, however long. And, and what strikes you as perhaps uh, um, a change or two that, that are going to endure and that we're, we're learning to do now and we're going to keep on doing? You know, uh, Stanley mentioned a few of those changes that I think will endure. And one of those has to do with the way we approach our business relations um, and also how we travel. Uh, I think we've all learned that we don't need to be face to face all the time. Sure, it's nice, uh, but business does not have to be conducted in that manner. We don't need to be jet setting about. Um, clearly, um, as an economist at Goldman Sachs, I spent uh, more than my fair share of time on airplanes and that sort of thing is not quite as important as it was, uh, in part because the people on the other side no longer expect it. It's okay to show your respect, show your kavod to the other person electronically. Um, and I think that is a change that was probably going to happen anyway, uh, but the COVID pandemic has advanced it dramatically. And of course, we've seen it in our social relationships uh, as well. Uh, so many people participated in high holiday services this past weekend uh, electronically. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it felt a little odd, but it was better than not having uh, those opportunities uh, at all. So that was one change. The other big thing that we need to look at very carefully is that the pandemic brought to the surface some underlying problems in the economy. And perhaps they were kept a little bit subterranean because overall the economy was growing and so on. But what we have seen very clearly is that so many of our fellow American citizens 
um, basically are not doing all that well economically. Uh, we see, for example, that the median wage in the United States adjusted for inflation has continued to move lower over the last 20 years. This is not a great thing. We have seen this widening of income inequality. Uh, there are many reasons for it. I, I don't know that we want to spend uh, so much time delving into all the many reasons, but there are a few buckets for it. One has to do uh, with educational opportunity. The other has to do with the investments we make as a nation. Are we investing enough in education? Are we investing enough in research and development? Um, some of the work that we published recently is actually quite discouraging uh, along those lines. Uh, the United States for a century was the leader in terms of investment in R&D, both in terms of dollars, but also as a percentage of our economy. Um, we're still number one in terms of dollars, although China's getting close in terms of being number two, but in terms of how much of our overall economy we dedicate to R&D investment, we're number eight. Um, that's yes, I read, that's not I, where we want to be. I read that number in your uh, in, in your report, and it's uh, it's pretty discouraging. Uh, and if 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 there is to be some uh, mood of redressing the inequalities that have been laid bare very starkly during the past several months, uh, if there is actually to be uh, a forward, long term thinking uh, move toward more investment in research. Um, Essentially, we're talking about uh, a, uh, a, a more robust federal government, a return to a robust role by the federal government. Yeah, and um, and if, if, if I'm sorry, if I could just interject for a moment, you had this interesting exchange with Dr. Fisher about the budget deficit. Mm -hmm. And one of the important things we need to look at is not just ability to pay for that deficit, but what did we use the money for? Mm -hmm. And over the past few years, we've been using it less and less for R&D. By the way, R&D helps not just technologists uh, and scientists. It helps the people in the new industries that get created as a consequence of those investments. We've also not invested in infrastructure. And one of the reasons that we have seen rural areas in the United States lag behind urban areas for the past 10 years has been that they've not had the infrastructure spend. They have broadband coverage of just about 60% as opposed to 95 to 99% in most cities. Uh, you, 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 as you speak, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of a part of the country where as a, as, a, as a journalist, I would find myself every other year uh, and even numbered years. And so it's the area between West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania, and Southern Ohio, around the Ohio River, where once steel mills, well, coal mines uh, dug out coal, steel mills made steel. Uh, up the river, they, they went on barges, and, and we made all courts, sorts of things like cars and trucks out of, uh, out of that. Uh, the area is dead. I mean, it, it's, uh, and, and uh, much of what happened in the election four years ago was a, a revolt of, of workers in those, in those areas saying, uh, no, one, no one's thinking about us. Uh, uh, how, do you, how would you tell those people, here's a policy which shows we're thinking about you and we want to uh, see you have a crack at the $85,000 job you used to have, not the $40,000 job driving for the county that you could have instead? What I think the focus really needs to be on what will the new growth industries be and what will the job opportunities be. So, for example, uh, jobs in the solar energy uh, area um, and uh, other forms of alternative energy, we, there are actually many more of those jobs now um, than there are in things like coal or the petrochemical industry in the United States, including fracking. Um, and, and so this has been an area of growth and these jobs pay well. Uh, if we were to focus more on R&D and investment in new technologies, this would actually, in my view, create new jobs. Uh, the investment in broadband as one form of infrastructure would allow some of these hard hit communities to become places where there could be jobs in call centers or in other types of jobs and, and communities, industries rather, that require that sort of interconnectivity. What we've heard from so many companies who sought to put warehouse facilities or other facilities in these communities is they couldn't do it because they couldn't get those facilities online 
with the rest of their operations. So those are just among some of the things to do. And the other aspect, and again here too, I'll harken back to something Stan mentioned before, is health. One of the things we're seeing in some of these hard hit areas where there have been permanent losses of jobs and permanent reductions in income is that the health outcomes are actually quite poor. And so we see, for example, that while uh, longevity uh, expected, you know, life expectancy in most of the United States has been rising, it's been declining in these other areas. Uh, some of it has to do with drug use. Um, some of it has to do with poor access to medical care. Uh, and that's something that I believe should be addressed and can be addressed through a more active federal intervention. Abby Joseph Cohen of Goldman Sachs. Uh, she was Goldman's chief global strategist uh, for many years and is now an advisory director there. Abby, stick around for the Q&A uh, in a few minutes uh, and thanks for your remarks. Uh, next, navigating the new abnormal economy, in particular dealing with real estate. Our third panelist is John Gray. Uh, Mr. Gray is president and chief operating officer of the Blackstone Group, the big private management firm that uh, invests heavily in, among other things, real estate. Uh, it's also invested in Hilton Worldwide, and John Gray is the chairman of Hilton. Uh, John Gray, welcome to Global Connections. Great to be here, Robert. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, the overall question. As you look at what's happened over the past half year and as you've made business decisions, uh, what changes in the economy do you figure are, are uh, passing uh, emergency measures, and what do you think are changes that are likely to endure and be with us for many years? Well, I think human behavior uh, tends to be stickier than sometimes we think in moments like this. I remember after 9-11, you know, people said we weren't going to be in buildings over 10 stories, we weren't going to get on planes, mm -hmm. we weren't going to go back to lower Manhattan, and of course all of that reversed very quickly. Um, this time some of the changes may be more permanent in nature, but Things like travel, which the other panelists have discussed, I think people want to get out. I was doing some telemedicine earlier with a nurse, and the first thing she said was, oh, you're in New York. I can't wait to get back to New York once COVID's passed. I think business travel will come back. Maybe it'll be slightly different. I think it comes back. We want to go to sporting events, and we want to go to music events. Um, I think that will all come back once there's a perception of safety. I think people will return to cities. Right now, you know, people aren't renting apartments. They're not going into their offices. I think, again, that changes. There may be some modifications, some remote work, but in general, people come back. Then I would say there are things, particularly in the virtual world, which have been accelerated that may not uh, come back. Shopping would be one of those. I think we've been watching the movement of goods online for some time. There's mm -hmm. been a step function increase. That I don't see going back in the same way, and that will have profound implications for shopping malls. But for the most part, I think once we get back to normalcy, people will go back to living their lives in many ways like they did before. But, but I mean, a, a lot of people are saying, you know, working from home isn't so bad, uh, and their bosses are saying productivity isn't that much less with people uh, working from home. Uh, so the value of office space uh, is suddenly, uh, you know, reconsidered. Uh, and uh, for, the, for the employee, the value of living in the city, well, why not go to an outer suburb where there's a lot of open spaces? Uh, those aren't decisions you, you unmake, uh, you know, every, every couple of years. Well, I, there's no question in the short term, office space is going to be under enormous pressure. And there will be some functions, uh, particularly functions, accounting function, maybe some technical functions, that can be done remotely. But I think a lot of what we do in office buildings involves collaborative work. It involves training. Many jobs are sort of apprenticeship in nature. Our investment business requires people really interacting. We've managed to do a lot of Zoom, but we have some of our people back today because it's helpful to be together. It's helpful to build a culture. So I do believe we may not have the same intensity of use, but I still think we'll have plenty of people in office buildings. And as an investor, the opportunities emerge when the perception of something gets so out of whack. So I think over the next six, 12 months, people will have very negative views of office buildings in their future, similarly negative views about cities. And my expectation is that'll create opportunities. If you look at London over hundreds of years, pandemics, fires, 
bombing, whatever. Every time they say it's over, it goes from strength to strength. <laughs> but, I'd but, be willing to bet New York comes back. And, okay. And I, I wouldn't bet against that. But in terms of real estate, I mean, the Hilton closed the Times Square Hilton uh, recently. That doesn't sound like a, a judgment, a vote of confidence in, in say, tourism to New York City. It, it sounds like uh, you figure things are, things are gone for a while. Yeah, I, I won't comment on a specific hotel, but Hilton as the manager franchise or doesn't close these. But but the hotel business in particular is under enormous pressure now, obviously, because there's very limited travel, particularly international travel, meetings, corporate travel. But urban hotels in America and places like New York and Chicago and San Francisco face very heavy pressure because there was lots of new building prior to the crisis. Airbnb exists, which impacts leisure travelers. And then these hotels tend to have very high labor costs. So it is possible, unfortunately, that a number of the older sort of grand dame hotels in these cities could potentially not reopen, and that's a negative. But I think you'll see many hotels reopen, just like restaurants will reopen, and these cities will come back. I'm not saying that asset values haven't declined in the short term. I'm just saying if you take a longer term perspective, people will want to come back to these cities. Does, does longer term, is that another way of saying after the vaccine? Well, sure, after the vaccine, and then it'll take time because Companies will have taken losses. They'll be hesitant. It'll take a while to book things. But in the fullness of time, if you said, do I believe the cash flow of some of these assets in 2024 or 25 will be back to 2019 levels? Yeah, I'd say that seems reasonable. So I think the key is to separate things that are transitory, as you pointed out, Mm -hmm. to things that are more permanent. And that's where I'd say the retail I'm much more concerned about. Blackstone owns a huge number of single-family homes that it's turned into rentals uh, through the uh, its invitation uh, housing. I guess is the is the venture, and I should I should note that Blackstone has has uh, denied this, but you were actually criticized by a UN human rights rapporteur for but one thing was aggressive evictions. So evictions is a subject nowadays. Uh, at one point, Governor Cuomo put a ban on uh, foreclosures and evictions uh, during the. A pandemic. The president has a somewhat, I think, more vague and narrow executive order about evictions and uh, foreclosures. What's happening out there? Are people are, are people falling behind on their rent? Are they are are they months in arrears? What's what's going on? Well, I'd start it by saying, as a firm, whether we own single family rentals or multifamily rentals, we are always very focused on being great landlords, treating tenants well, and we dispute those, those uh, comments. Well, but the, I, I would say, relation, the landlord-tenant relationship is not one of the easiest ones in the... Uh, yeah, what, what I would say is in the near term, frankly, since the crisis, everyone was highly concerned about lack of rental payments. The reality has been much better. For our portfolio, it's been in the high 90s percent wise, which is everyone would be surprised by. But that's a function, I think, partially because of the stimulus checks partially because people say, hey, a roof over my head in this environment is really important. And, and also, um, people are not spending the way they were before, right? They're not out shopping, they're not traveling, and so they have money to cover their rent. We've seen a lot of strength in consumer credit that we didn't anticipate. So housing and rental housing has been better. And in those cases where people are really you know, facing hard times, Landlords like us have have tried to be as helpful as possible in this context. So the good news has been the sort of wave of both evictions or foreclosures that were anticipated hasn't come to pass. And that's certainly a good thing for our society. But but has it not come to pass uh, because of uh, of forbearance, uh, because of COVID-19, or because people are actually making the payments? Uh, it's actually more on the rental side, and, and frankly, on the, on the mortgage side, payment rates have been much higher than I anticipated. And I, it's a variety of factors, but that's been a positive side. And consumers overall, if you looked at credit card payments, if you looked at pretty much auto loans, anywhere you'd expect to see weakness in consumer finance, it's been healthier than you would expect. And I just want to, uh, before uh, moving on, I just wanted to run past you what Abby Joseph Cohen said and ask you if, if you agree. She was, Abby was giving the the bright side of what we've learned about, about uh, uh, what we can do without being face-to-face. As you've said, there are reasons for bringing people into the office. Uh, and I wonder, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've had this conversation with everyone from business people to psychiatrists and how are they managing their relationships uh, uh, in, in the age of Zoom. Uh, 
how much has it changed for you? That is, are you willing to say that uh, business can be done with a lot less face-to-face contact? I would say some elements of business, yes. But uh, we think about what we do as a team sport. You know, when you're underwriting real estate or companies, infrastructure, you've got a bunch of people with different expertise. You're coming together. Um, you're trying to finance investment. You're dealing with your investors, raising capital. It's a complex sort of ecosystem, and it's better together. I'm not saying that this doesn't work. We managed to make it work. In the first half of the year, we raised nearly $50 billion from our investors. We deployed $11 billion in public securities when the markets went off in March. We can make it work, but if I want to build the best firm with the best culture and be as creative as possible, it's better together. Okay. John Gray, hang in there. We're going to be taking questions from the attendees in a moment. Uh, Thanks. John Gray of Blackstone. Uh, We have checked in on past uh, global connections with Dr. Michael Drescher, uh, who runs the emergency department at uh, uh, Rabin Medical Center in Pedach Tikva in the greater Tel Aviv area in Israel, about Israel's experience of COVID-19. Mike Drescher, who divides his time between uh, Pedach Tikva and and Hartford, Connecticut, uh, joins us once again for a few minutes. And, uh, you know, the first time we spoke in the end of June, Israel was on top of this thing. As you told us, it played uh, to Israel's natural strengths. It's a relatively small country, only one big airport, uh, pretty secure borders. The next time we spoke, uh, school had resumed and there were some, some outbreaks. Now it seems as though, uh, uh, I mean, you, your, your hospital is now taking overflow patients from, from Jerusalem hospitals, yes? Yes, that's correct, Robert. Uh, we um, have opened up in, in two... Uh, wards that are dedicated to uh, COVID patients. One of the wards is uh, in our parking garage. Uh, We have an underground garage underneath our emergency department. It's of course no longer a parking garage. It's been turned into a full-fledged hospital ward, uh, which has been something to see. But yes, we have been taking from areas of the country which are uh, harder hit in terms of the severity of their illness and bringing them to uh, to Baylinson. I mean, a harder hit as in they, they don't have the hospital beds for them. Uh, correct. Well, harder hit in the sense of uh, more uh, ill people, but also in, 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 in fewer beds per, per, uh, per capita and per sick person. The, uh, the, the bad news about COVID-19 in Israel is that the, cases, the number of cases have risen. The good news is your mortality rate in Israel seems to be quite low by our standards in the, certainly by our standards in the States. Uh, yeah, well, the one thing that it's, uh, that it puts Israel in a bit of a different position is the, is the uh, age, the general age of the population. We have probably the highest uh, level of uh, children per family in the Western world. Uh, so there's a lot more uh, young people. And young people, as we know, in, in the era of, era of COVID are not uh, as severely affected. They are, in, they are infected, but they're not um, as severely ill by any means. And so we have a lot more infected people, but, but fewer, uh, but fewer uh, fatalities as a result of that, um, a much younger population in general. I mean, the biggest families uh, in Israel tend to be Haredi families, so the, uh, very orthodox families. And that appears to be where the, the greatest outbreaks have been in, in uh, Haredi neighborhoods. Yes, it, it, over the past few days, really, or weeks to days, we've been seeing a kind of a leveling. That is, the, the the general population has become more infected. But it's still true that the hot spots have been generally in Haredi neighborhoods and also in some of the Arab uh, areas for perhaps for other reasons. But those really have been the outstanding uh, neighborhoods or towns that have been affected. Uh, I'm, I, I asked you this the first time we spoke, and, and I'll ask you for an update. Have you learned more about this disease since, if you know, in the, in the past couple of months? Have, have Israeli doctors <laughs> learned more that informs the way that they're treating people better? Uh, absolutely. The answer is yes. We, uh, a lot of the burden on the medical system of this, of this disease is, is the logistics of it. That is, there are people who are very ill who require intensive care, et cetera. But there are a lot of people who are not particularly ill <clears throat> But the way in which they need to be dealt with in order to keep the disease from spreading uh, requires a lot of logistics, requires, uh, of course, 
personal protective equipment, requires isolation. We have a, every emergency department in the country, including ours in uh, the Rabin Medical Center, has a separate wing for suspected people with COVID. Now, they don't all have COVID, so we need to keep people isolated one from the other. We have a separate area for people who have been uh, identi identified as positive for the disease. But this all requires a whole new setup of, of how we of patients flow and how we take care of uh, and how we take care of patients. So in addition to having intensive care, internal medicine wards for patients who are significantly ill, we also have a, the whole system needs to be set up for dealing with this. And we've learned to do it well. We've learned to take care of people. Our, 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 we have a significant number of, of uh, staff who have been either in isolation or have gotten ill, but not from, by and large, not from patients in the hospital, from the surrounding area, from families, schools, et cetera, like the rest of the population. Well, Mike Drescher, Dr. Michael Drescher, head of the emergency department at the Rabin Medical Center. Thanks. And hang in there with us in case we get some questions about, about the disease. The way you pose questions is through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we have several uh, questions already. This is one for Stan Fisher uh, and whoever else would like to answer. What's the best economic policy to follow with China? The best thing that can be done is uh, trying to reverse our policies. I'm not sure that uh, we're going to keep, we're going to do that. So uh, we're in a very difficult situation with China and uh, we better recognize that and we better try and uh, try and reverse some of the uh, aspects which are unnecessarily hostile. But uh, Trump uh, is a fairly aggressive guy. And she is probably a fairly aggressive guy as well. So we've got two players in this game that are not uh, looking as if they're going to find it uh, desirable to be good friends. Uh, Abby Joseph Cohen, uh, what are the main, this is uh, from another anonymous attendee, uh, what are the main differences for the stock market and the economy's recovery between a Biden or a Trump presidency? Um, one, wonderful question. Uh, let me see if I can walk very carefully uh, through this answer. Um, I'm going to begin by agreeing with something else that Stan said earlier, and that is the number one uh, factor is going to be how the health situation plays out. Um, if the pandemic shows signs of being out of control, um, if it appears that government policy is not getting uh, things under control uh, because uh, there are, there's limited mask wearing, um, inadequate social distancing, and the disease incident rate doesn't go down, that's the worst possible uh, baseline case uh, for the economy. So for the economy to truly recover, uh, we need to have, um, I think, uh, a more proactive approach towards health. Um, and I would suggest that Mr. Biden uh, and his administration would do that. Uh, not just a question of the messaging from a prospective new president, but also uh, the attention paid to the science of the matter, uh, recognizing uh, that we have learned a great deal uh, as a global health community over the last nine months, and we ought to be applying that uh, in, in an important way. Uh, number two, we be looking at policy. Um, in terms of monetary policy, I think the Federal Reserve deserves an enormous amount of credit uh, for having uh, stayed the course, having recognized uh, that they needed to be, um, if you will, the adults in the room um, and needed, needing to uh, tack, using the sail board, uh, sailing term, uh, when fiscal policy was, was not doing the job appropriately. With regard to fiscal policy, I do think there'd be differences uh, between a, a second Trump administration and a Biden administration. Now, do we really know uh, what either would uh, put forth? No, we don't. Nor do we know what the new Congress would agree to. Um, until we know um, whether uh, one party is in the White House and who's controlling the Senate, which party's controlling the House, a lot of this is very speculative. So all I can go on are some of the guidelines that each admin, each um, a candidate has put out there. Um, I would say that Mr. Trump's proposals for second term or shall we say very skimpy. That is, we have very little information uh, about what he would do or what he would do differently. Uh, Mr. Biden is out there talking about reversing uh, part of the uh, tax cuts that were implemented 
um, um, in uh, 2017, uh, enact in 2017, implement in 2018. And the changes that they've put forth make sense to me. Uh, basically, uh, an increase uh, in the corporate tax rate um, still would be lower than it was before, but raising it somewhat, uh, raising taxes on uh, individuals with income of $400,000 or more and so on. So nothing particularly uh, grievous, if you will, um, uh, for most. Um, but also, uh, a Biden administration has made some proposals with regard to shoring up Social Security uh, and also Medicare. There's also a big difference in terms of the treatment, and this will be the last comment, uh, treatment in term, policy treatment in terms of the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. I think many people are aware uh, that the Trump administration is in court right now uh, trying to get rid of the ACA uh, and the coverage for roughly 20 million Americans during a pandemic. Uh, what the Biden campaign has proposed and who knows what would actually get passed, would be a shoring up of the ACA, number one. And number two, also the possibility of lowering the retirement age and, and eligibility age for Medicare from 65 to 60 years of age. This might be very helpful for people who find themselves uh, perhaps retiring earlier than they had expected to because of the economic distress uh, related to the pandemic. A couple of questions for, for John Gray. Uh, uh, our uh, questioner asks, Blackstone recently mentioned that they're starting to see distressed deals. Uh, is that a leading indicator of what's to come? How is this different from 2008? So, yes, after you have a sharp downturn, uh, you begin to see distress materialize. First, obviously, we saw in March asset prices went down, but we've seen the stock market come back. In private markets, it takes longer. So if you own a business with too much leverage or a piece of real estate, it's a while. You use your reserves to pay your debt service. Then you hit the wall. Maybe you file bankruptcy. You go into foreclosure. That process takes time. Um, in 08, 09, the whole process took much longer. The, the size of the issue was so large. The financial system itself was under stress, as everybody recalls. The real economy got drag, dragged down. In this case, the financial system was actually in pretty okay. good shape yep. going in, and the real economy got shut down by the virus. So we don't have nearly the same level of distress. It's much more focused in this select group of industries we've been talking about, travel, real estate, energy, retail. Um, but we will see more of it. It'll take several years to work out. And there will be opportunities to buy assets at prices that are significantly below where they were before. The key thing will be, is something cyclically impacted? We own a, a water park business that I believe once it's safe, people will take their kids back to water parks versus, say, a department store chain or movie theaters or other businesses that are really secularly impacted and the pandemic's accelerated. I think you've got to differentiate between the two. But if you do that, I do think yeah. there'll be some interesting opportunities to invest. Uh, well, a, a follow-up question from one from an attendee is, what specifically will take the place of retail venues in the new real estate economy, uh, that is street-level stores, malls and the like? If, if the old retailers are gone, my own idea, yeah. by the way, is mega restaurants where there's yeah. huge, well, so that there's space between all the tables. What, what do you see? You, you know well, it's, it's interesting. If you go to China or other places, China's actually advanced relative to us as it relates to mobile technology and e-commerce. Their malls have a much smaller percentage that sell physical goods. So it's much more cooking class. It's much more entertainment centers, restaurants. I think you'll see more of that, more service retail, nail salons. The spaces, in many cases, I think will get occupied. The biggest power center boxes may not, the biggest department stores, but you'll find new uses. The rents will come down, but the movement to e-commerce will continue. And so um, that is a trend that is so tough to fight. We have seen sectors like supermarkets and uh, Walmart and Costco hang in there uh, because they provide a really essential function, but many traditional retailers will face real headwinds. And then you'll see more of a showroom approach. If you think about Apple, it's, it's doing a lot large volume of sales in a small space. And you could see companies who have a small number of locations 
smaller sizes because you no longer store goods on premise. So retail will reinvent, there'll be other uses, but it's gonna require a lot of capital and the rents will likely be a lot lower. I was just curious, Abby Joseph Cohen, do you have any, any thoughts on the, uh, the, the look of, uh, of American retail real estate space in the future? Um, I think that John has made some very interesting points. We also need to distinguish between urban centers and other parts of the country. Um, I think in urban centers, uh, we may see that some of that space is taken over um, in terms of service establishments, but not necessarily retail service. Uh, some of it could be healthcare related. Uh, some of it could be um, uh, the, the sort of uh, service industries per se uh, that we see. Uh, what I do worry about um, is in some of the uh, less urban areas of the United States where there have been uh, job losses, um, and it's not yet clear what the new jobs uh, will be. You know, one of the things about cities, and one of the reasons I remain optimistic uh, about cities, is that there's an ecosystem. Uh, people want to live um, where there are many different uh, types of activities. They want to live where there are employment opportunities and entertainment opportunities and so on. In some of these more rural areas uh, where there has been dramatic loss of population over the last uh, 20 to 25 years, it's not quite clear to me uh, how some of this real estate is going to be used in the future. Um, we see some of it uh, being used for warehouses. We see some of it being used for distribution centers, uh, but those by and large are not good paying jobs. Uh, we have a question for uh, Dr. Drescher. How are Israeli hospitals partnering during this crisis? They, I assume they mean partnering with each other. Yes. Uh, so, uh, as, as mentioned before, um, we are at the Rabin Center taking on patients where there is overflow from, uh, for instance, a colleague of mine from Jerusalem who called up and said, listen, we are, we're looking for places to put our positive COVID patients. And so that is one way. There, there, there have been other, uh, in terms of, um, when, as, the, as the entire laboratory system for testing got ramped up, there were centers that were ready and there were centers that were not. So a lot of places were sending off their uh, lab, their lab uh, uh, needs to, to other places. Uh, so those are, the, those are two examples. There has, and of course, at the level of national kind of policy and uh, presenting uh, the situation to uh, the political powers that be, of course, that's been another kind of collective uh, activity of the medical community. So there's been various ways in, in which it's been, it has been a national effort to some extent. Uh, there's been very little uh, competition or, or, or backbiting or, or, or anything like that. With it. It's been a, a, quite a, a collective uh, uh, effort with each person, each community taking care of its, its unique local uh, problems, but there has been collaboration across uh, various areas. But, it, it, but it, implicit in that, Israel, uh, like the United States, the leadership said, handle this locally. Uh, as opposed to, we'll run everything out of the ministry here. Uh, well, that's not exactly true. There has there has been a lot more uh, Ministry of Health involvement, uh, even from the outset in terms of directing. There's been at least an attempt at it. You know, there's been a lot of uncertainty. Nobody has had a roadmap from the outset to say uh, this is the way things are going to go. But there's been quite a lot of effort of, of central. Uh, uh, at least guidance as to which way to take this. The Army also, I should say, has taken quite a, the Home Front Command has taken uh, in some areas a lead in helping to organize the response. Stan Fisher, you, you uh, raised your hand. Yeah, this is a question for, for the others. Um, we don't, uh, I haven't heard anything about progress with uh, vaccines. Mm -hmm. Do we know what's going on? Well, uh, uh, do we know beyond the fact we have, what, four vaccines into phase three trials? Uh, whoever wants to pick up and uh, uh, and who knows more, uh, Dr. Drescher, you... you well, I, I will say that, you know, there's a lot of hope out there and there's a, 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 a very thin on actual um, uh, knowledge as to what when things are going to happen. Optimists are saying uh, this fall, winter, uh, now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we're, you know, is, is there going to be a, a vaccine that has been shown to work 
Even if so, what is the distribution of that going to be? How, how fast is that going to be going out to populations? Most of the vaccines that are underway now are, are two-stage vaccines, which are going to require three weeks between vaccine, between uh, uh, applications in any case. So I don't think that there, anybody can say for sure. I'm, I'm quite optimistic that by the beginning of next year, there's going to be a large degree of, of uh, there's, so much, there's so much need for it. There's so much uh, motivation uh, uh, economically for people to get it through. I believe that it's going to happen. And there's stage three trials uh, are, are, happen, are, are, are underway as we speak. So I think it's going to happen. And as a, as a, as a physician, um, explain what the utility is of a vaccine that is 50% effective or 51% effective and gets FDA approval on that, on that basis. How much does that change the magnitude of the problem that, that you face with an infectious disease? Well, it's a game changer because uh, the, the disease, and of course, def- depending on the infectivity of the disease, the percentage of people who need to be immunized uh, is, is higher as the disease is more infected. But if you have a, a disease which is infective to some degree, but you can reduce by, by half or by some other percentage the number of people who are, who are susceptible or vulnerable, you reduce the likelihood that this disease can 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 uh, uh, can pervade can be pervasive in the population, and um, and reduce and, and bring it to the point where there's a, a famous number which is an R efficient coefficient, which is how infective this disease is. You reduce that R coefficient to less than one, the disease eventually goes away, at least for that that period of time that in, that immunization is around, like the flu or like right. any other. That would mean that on average, a person with the with the the uh, the virus uh, would would uh, pass it on. On average, ten people would pass it on to fewer than ten other people. That would, would correct. Be- Eventually, there's a there's a uh, the, the disease dies out that way. And the more people who are not are, who are not known, if you have five people in a household and four of them are immune, the likelihood of it passing from that household to another household is is markedly less. There's a question, by the way, for Stan Fisher about. Um, uh, uh, about the United Arab Emirates uh, deal, which was, is that normalization changing anything economically or is it simply making things, quote, more public? That is, was Israel doing business with people in the UAE anyway, just off the books or, or, or uh, out of the spotlight, let's say? Well, you used to hear people saying for quite some time, oh, I've been to the UAE and I go there all the time and I have a room in a hotel and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it existed, uh, was my conclusion after listening to that story many times. Um, but uh, having something which is well concealed uh, is probably always less good than having something that is open and that can be uh, explained to everybody. And uh, it, it, it could be very important. It's, uh, it's in some sense the first example of uh, two countries just getting together and uh, figuring out they may, they may get benefits from it, aside from not having to shoot at each other. Yes, that's always a, it's always an improvement uh, when, when, we can, when we can avoid that. I'd just like to hear from each of you, just in a, in a, in a quick round, yes or no. I'm just curious, in your gut, uh, do you think that next year at this time, if we were, were all to get together, the same of us, and talk about what's going on, uh, that things will be radically different and better than they are right now? Or do you think that uh, come uh, 2021 or 57, 82, whatever, I'm not sure what, what year that's going to be, uh, that things will be pretty much as they are now, if, if, if not worse? Uh, Mike Drescher, I think you were saying you expect things to get better. Yes, I do. I'm going to take one minute before that, Robert, just to, as somebody who's from the actual uh, Rabin Medical Center and uh, to, to thank Josh Plout and to thank all of you folks for, for making this happen. I mean, this is really, uh, this is an exceptional uh, group of people. And, and I really want to say on behalf of the Medical Center, thank you very much to everybody for making this happen. Having said that, I also want to say that, yes, I'm optimistic. I think that there is going to be a, there is going to be a vaccine. I think people, things are going to come back. People are going to have the same needs and desires that they had before. And I think that we're going to be sitting in a very different position uh, in a year from now than we are today. Stan Fisher, are you that optimistic about a year from now? No, I don't, I don't know enough to, uh, to know. Okay, fair enough. Abby Joseph Cohen? 
Um, there's an awful lot we don't know. Um, I think the election outcome in the United States will be critically important. And I will just repeat um, a comment and, and logo that we have hanging in my home, which is trust science. Um, and I think if we have leaders who don't trust science, um, it's going to take us quite a long time uh, to get to where we want to be. John Gray, optimistic? I'm in the optimism camp. I think a year from now, we'll have a vaccine. Um, it'll be mostly effective. We'll go back to life. Um, there'll be a lot of weddings and bar mitzvahs. And I think we'll all be a lot happier. And I'd get to meet these great people in person. So okay. thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to all of our guests, Dr. Stanley Fisher, Abby Joseph Cohen, Jonathan Gray, Dr. Michael Drescher, and uh, many thanks to, as uh, Mike Drescher mentioned, many thanks to Joshua Plout, also uh, Nate Bonzani and uh, Rony Gibigliano from American Friends of the Ravine Medical Center, uh, and our video and Zoom director, Bobby Grandone. Uh, thanks to our program sponsor, which is the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, uh, which is a 501c3 national charitable organization representing in the United States, uh, Israel's largest hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv. Uh, the website of the medical center is www.afrmc.org. Join us next time uh, when our Global Connections topic uh, will be uh, breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer during COVID-19. A bit of a change of pace. Uh, patient challenges in diagnosis and treatment. Uh, I'm Robert Siegel, and this has been uh, Global Connections Navigating the New Abnormal. See you next month. Uh, stay healthy and stay safe.